Welcome to the show, you two. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you again. Jackie and I were hanging out today. I got a lot of your background, which is yeah. good because yeah. I didn't know that much about you. And so we're prepped for the interview. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you. Arthur and I text a lot about all things amp coil and <laughs> natural healing and stuff. So it's good to sit down with you too. So as you know, and the audience will know one way or another, I just sat down with a team from amp coil and talked about that technology. And now we're going to be spending this episode, which will likely come out as some type of bonus episode talking about wellness for humanity. Wonderful. So I'm really excited because I've never actually highlighted a nonprofit on the show. I've never really talked about anything uh, charitable in any meaningful way and definitely not centered a show on it. So this is a first out of 100 and 70 something episodes delighted yeah to be your first that's awesome thanks yeah me yeah. too and i'm i'm delighted for the the cause and and everything too i don't it just it's not like i tried to avoid it but it just didn't come up until now and i go aha here's the one perfect <laughs> so there we go so let's jump right into it i'd like to hear from each one of you uh how you got involved in health and wellness uh, and how that led up eventually to wellness for humanity and all of that. If you want to start, Arthur, and just um, give us a little bit of background. Sure. Uh, well, the health and wellness uh, piece came to me uh, with my mother, who was an RN when I was uh, a teenager. Uh, I was a professional skateboarder in the 70s. And, oh, uh, no way. Yeah. Where'd you live? Uh, well, I lived, I grew up in Hawaii, part of my life in Hawaii. Oh. And I met all the Dogtown guys in Hawaii. And I was a skateboarder for Town & Country and a bunch of others. Really? Oh, that's crazy. Uh -huh. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I had a wallpaper steamer uh, fall over boiling water on my foot. And uh, I pulled my sock off and my skin came off with my sock. And uh, my mom used uh, aloe vera and vitamin A and vitamin E and colored gels and shine color therapy on my foot and healed my foot in three weeks. And I went and won a national skateboard competition. What? Yes. How did your mom know about that technology she, back then? She was just this holistic person, even though she was a standard RN in a hospital. She studied every possible healing modality. She has literally bookcases full of books about healing and metaphysics and all that. So... How interesting. So you're an, you're an OG skater. I never would have guessed that. It's, it's funny, you know, as we, as we get older, as gentlemen, as we do, it's funny to think back. Like I think of you, you maybe got a couple years of me or something like that, but I'd never picture you like skating around Hawaii, smoking weed, listening to punk rock. Cause we're like older guys. Yes. So we're going to look at pictures of myself at 13, wearing my black Sabbath shirt and my camouflage jacket and my little, you know, eighties gangster situation I had going on there. Uh, kids now that dress like that would probably never guess that I used to be one of those strange generational thing. So, uh, so that led you into your own exploration of, of the hidden powers of, of natural healing then. Absolutely. I learned all about flower essences and gem essences and homeopathics and never really took much medicines except maybe three or four times antibiotics. The rest of it's all through natural and um, just in interesting uh, piece. Uh, I've had only four colds in 17 years. Oh my God! So that's wild. I need to do whatever you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> I always think I'm the healthiest guy in the world, and then I'm. I used to not get colds back in the day. It would be three, four years in between. In the last couple of years, I have to admit, unfortunately, that I have not been that lucky. Um, wow. So, and what did you do professionally before doing this foundation? Did you work in the industry or did you stray off and do other things after being a little skate punk? You know, I actually, um, my dad was a naval aviator and uh, I was around airplanes and I uh, got caught in a very interesting situation. Uh, I got hired to do set up detail shops in Southern Florida uh, and uh the guy that funded the whole thing ev evidently was corrupt on some level. So my bonus ne that next week that I was supposed to get, I didn't get. And then I had to go hustle. And so I knew there were airports. So I started going around airports and started cleaning airplanes. And within six weeks, I had four guys working for me and um, started an aircraft detailing business. My brother still runs that one 30 years ago. I started it 30 years ago. And I, then I came to Southern California, did the same thing, did that for 30 years. 
Wow, so, detailing airplanes. Private jets and guys that own car collections. Really? Yes. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Because I've in, in my time, I've known a couple guys that started. I mean, it's it's somewhat common entrepreneurial venture sure. of someone that you know figures out how to clean a car really well and tweak out on it, and then they hire a couple other guys to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and they have your little deta mobile detailing business. But the plane thing, that's <laughs> smart. I like that. Yeah. Screw I, doing junky cars. Do private jets. That's amazing. <laughs> and I had some incredible clients uh that would find out i did jets and their friend was wilt chamberlain i went and did wilt chamberlain's um uh, maserati one time and that he was an interesting guy to say the least but i always found myself meeting he other has an interesting claim to fame too for our younger listeners he was quite the ladies man they say oh yes well i'll tell you one former pro basketball player yeah. yes exactly not dating here <laughs> yeah he had an interesting thing about health too and so I was working on his car, and he says, hey, I'm going to get, get you some, give you some bug juice. And I'm like, bug juice? What's that? And he came out, and he hand-squeezed uh, uh, with a juicer a half a gallon of juice for me to drink while I was detailing his car. And, uh, but that's what I found. No matter where I was, people were always interested in sharing their health stories on whatever they were. And it just kept my interest over the years. It's just fascinating to see how like attracts like, you know, when you're right. in that realm, then that gets attracted to you. And then how did Wellness for Humanity uh, come to be? Well, it, it ha goes all the way back to Hawaii. I met a guy named Tom Wilhite who started an organization called PSI, P -S -I, which is kind of the heart-based EST, and that got started. And I got to do some trainings with him, and he helped pull that out of me. I actually said in the future, I'm dreaming about helping humanity. He goes, well, what would that look like? I go, well, that is wellness, wellness for humanity. And that was literally birthed when I was 14 years old living in Hawaii. Oh, no way. I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> I thought you just two years ago, you're like, hey, I found this cool device. I'd like to help people get it. But that vision <laughs> it's kind been, of has yes. been percolating in the background this whole time. It's kind yes. of amazing since 14. Yeah. Wow. Yeah trip out <laughs> so this okay is, this is life purpose this and we're gonna go we're gonna purpose. go more into the foundation obviously but i wanted to just kind of get a backstory because i don't know you that well we're, we're friendly and i've right. we've kind of worked together and done some events and stuff but i don't actually know that much about you so thank you for that and mm -hmm. uh and i just found out you live in carbondale i do colorado <laughs> which i've lived very nearby there and my dad lived by there for for many many years so that's another uh, interesting point so how about you jackie I learned a lot about you today. You have a you have an interesting background too. Tell us a little bit about your natural healing. Uh, I have an interesting background. Journey um, came into it unexpectedly. So you know, started more in a normal co course of life. Had um, got married, had some kids, started a business, very traditional, and found myself in a situation where we had trauma in the family. And everyone in the family was deeply affected and having a very hard time. And often when you have trauma, not only are there emotional issues, but you start to get the autoimmune pieces coming in. And what I found was that friends, family, friends, anybody who had contact with us would start to offer these ways of helping that seemed nuts. You know, nothing that I was familiar with, nothing that I'd heard about before. And I was very protective of my kids. And what I wanted to do was stay the traditional route and just sort of have this beautiful capsule of protection. Um, but over time, what I found was that folks would come in and they would offer something that I couldn't really understand or explain. And it ha would have a profound benefit. And... I started to research more. I started to allow things that I could ascertain would be helpful without any potential harm. And what I started seeing was tremendous results. And the kids were feeling better. Health was improving. Often I would find that the doctors that were working with us would actually call me in and talk to me. What is it that you're doing exactly? Because the changes that we're seeing um, in the physiology are incredible. And it would continue. And as I moved into it, I started to explore more. And it was, it was really kind of fun. I could have an opportunity to see what worked well, just to see 
which were the tools that the kids would go to and choose when they didn't feel good, right? Someone's got a stomach ache or someone's got a headache and you have a variety of different things in the house and they would gravitate to the ones that they knew would help them feel better. And over time, it increasingly became um, work that I championed. And I found that I started doing it with family and then with friends, and I would get training here or get training there. Um, I've worked out of a hospital setting um, doing some of this work and then became really interested in exactly how much is it helping people. So starting to look at some data collection and some clinical research to see exactly what it was that this was doing. So it's been quite the journey, and it, this has been 15 years at least, 15, 18 years. From talking doing this. to you today, uh, and you just dropping the names of a couple different technologies that you've used, uh, you got into this before this term existed, but you might not know that you're even one of these, but you're a full-on biohacker. Are you aware of that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you know that term? <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of the term. I don't know that yeah. I'm completely aware of what <clears throat> well, a, a, that means. A bio, I think Dave Asprey from Bulletproof may have coined this term mm -hmm. uh, or at least take credit for it. I'm probably dead. But um, I think his analysis of, of the terminology is that, you know, it's learning how to take control of your own biology and having a sense of responsibility and an autonomy over your own health, mm -hmm. physical, mental, spiritual, all of that rather than having to rely on a medical system, kind of becoming your own doctor. And so one of these people would, you referenced the word tools, one of these people then who's a biohacker would f get access to tools, learn about them and apply them to their own issues and fix themselves mm -hmm. rather than having to go elsewhere. And so like a computer hacker figures out the algorithms of a computer and gets in there and debugs it and fixes it and optimizes it. A biohacker would do that with their own biology by gaining an understanding of their physiology and different organ systems and glands, glandular systems mm -hmm. and all that, right? Yeah. So it's not like you've done a fair amount of that. I've done some of that. And um, what's wonderful is this place of choice where rather than hoping that someone else is going to be able to come in and fix. And often our experience was that as much as we were following the traditional route, we weren't getting the benefit that we were hoping for. And things were continuing to be really challenging, um, a lot of medications and a lot of physiological problems. And as we started to discover that there might be other ways to just ease some of this and resolve some of it, um, what an incredible moment in life to find that you have the ability to choose uh, to step into an experience where you can take responsibility for yourself and see whether you can adjust the experience that you're having in a way that just improves the quality of life so yeah yeah and in in that responsibility too it uh, nullifies victimhood too which is so which disempowering is a beautiful right thing. yeah yeah i found that to be true in many of the things that i've worked on uh, myself psychologically physically and otherwise when i'm not mm -hmm. like why is this happening to me it's such a weak <laughs> position of power you know yeah uh so when you're working on your kids and things like that and the issues that they were having um it sounds like some of the stuff you did perhaps was in you know dietary changes herbalism and things like that and mm -hmm. then some were in the technology space which mm -hmm. is what i got from you today yeah what are some of the different technologies um, and modalities and in the energetics and devices and things like that that you've experimented with that you've found have some efficacy? Uh, there, are, there are many. There are um, some biofeedback devices that have been phenomenal. And that's where I started and I found that it had significant benefit. Um, we saw a lot of changes. There were, as a result of using those tools, there were changes in medications. Um, there was definitely a drop in medication where there were autoimmune issues, the levels in the body, the hormonal levels would start to shift and there would be significant verifiable improvement. There were some light therapies. We used some laser therapies. Some of it was not technolo technological and simply um, meditation and starting to become more aware of being able to drop into that space where you're still and you're relaxed and you see sleep patterns improving and you see behavior start to improve. Um, so many, many different modalities. And um, what I found is that each one has a little bit of a different piece. I find it, it's interesting. You would think that all tools would work equally for all people, 
but that hasn't really been my experience. It seems like there are some tools that work better for some portion of the population. And, you know, I, I know people who gravitate toward a specific type of, you know, cold wave laser. And for them, that's the best thing on the planet. They don't know how they're going to live without it. And other people can try that tool and say, yeah, not so much, not for me. So um, for each person, it's an experience of looking to see what works best. And I've been doing this, as I, as I said, over 15 years. And I'm always astonished when I find a tool that seems to work incredibly effectively for the majority of people who, who use it and experience it. So... Cool. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. And then with you, Arthur, I mean, you sound like you've just been the pillar of health. <laughs> <laughs> Other than burning your foot off, uh, ha have you had any health challenges within your immediate family or, or yourself that you've, you know, had to work through or been put in a position where you, you know, you really had to do some searching and find alternative means by which to get well? I, I've had uh, the good fortune in my immediate family. No one's ever had really anything serious, though. Uh, I had, uh, when I was in 2006, I had a, um, a trip to Peru and I had a really bad experience with bad water and it was extreme. And, uh, three years later, I had a very serious situation of extreme parasites and heavy metal and, uh, created uh, loss of short-term memory for nine months. And uh, I was married at the time. We're still very good friends. But she was the one that taught me everything about taking the food and what oils to cook with and all of those combinations which could help pull those uh, toxins out of my system and the, move the parasites out of my system. So it was pretty uh, devastating because I lost everything. I lost my property and my vehicles. And so it was very intense hardship. Wow. Oh, so you did have a, a bout there. I did. <laughs> wow. I've never even lost my property. Well, I've never had any properties. That's why. <laughs> uh, okay. And then how did you, uh, each of you, how did each of you come to find out about the amp coil? And then I want to find out how that, you know, uh, manifested into the, the foundation too. Sure. Uh, it's an interesting piece. Uh, Aaron was introduced to me by a, a mutual friend of ours. And sh this woman wanted to make sure that we knew about each other. And uh, we met at, in the front of her house in the garage <laughs> in, in, in Santa Cruz. And it was like he was my younger brother. And we made a pact right there in the garage. Like I told him about my dream about Wellness for Humanity. He said, well, I, I want to build something to help people with Lyme. And so we made a pact. I'll help you with amp coil and you helped me with the foundation it was very fascinating how it came about uh, because I was so into frequencies and so many other things I actually was early on involved more with amp coil and actually built some of the programs and uh, and they started working so well and that's what really lit a fire underneath me because I'm like okay now there's a tool and I can now focus on the foundation and we have a really good tool so let's prove the validity of it validity and let's prove you know through observation you know is this really val valid technology that can really help people so uh and that's kind of how jackie came into it and i'll just say that you know thank good you know it was so amazing to have that opportunity with her because she was very analytical and like let's look at this very strategically and make sure that this is uh, systems and and system trackers and being able to prove the technology and its and its worth mm -hmm. and so that's how it it started to come about and um, Jackie you can yeah um, Aaron and I have been friends for about 15 years I've known Aaron and Geneva for a very long time I've known them through other industries that we were mutually involved in and had been aware that they were in the process of creating this technology from before it was something that was completely packaged, kind of from the very beginning. So we'd be in conversation about it back and forth. And in my world, I was very busy. Life had kind of moved on. I was doing other things. And then every six months or so, we'd have a conversation. And then my partner started 
becoming ill, he had Lyme disease. And in his family, his niece and her family, her, she and her husband, two children in the household with Lyme disease. That seems to always happen, right? What has or been astonishing time? to me um, in all of this is how widespread this is. I didn't realize how much of an epidemic it was and how many of the people that experience this actually find that almost every member of the family is dealing with the same kind of issue. So it's not just that it's affecting one person, but you've got children in the family and usually one or both parents who are dealing with the same thing, which raises the question, although it's not at this point um, understood by traditional science or this you know, the CDC that it's sexually transmitted or that it's easily transmitted in utero, but it certainly appears that way. So moving forward, it'll be really interesting to see what the data shows. And the experience certainly of the population is that that's happening, that when one person in the family has it, that it seems the entire family has it. And it comes, not only is it you know, you may get one person who tests positive for Lyme, but everybody else then starts to exhibit the exhaustion, the fatigue, all of the symptoms that go with it, and, you know, diagnostically verifiable autoimmune conditions. So, you know, that piece is astonishing. And to, to try and move through this, my understanding is that for some people who have an immediate diagnosis and they do a long course of antibiotics, they might do relatively well. But I speak to many people who've done that and don't do well, and they continue to really struggle. So having somebody in the family that was experiencing this, I reached out to my friend and said, hey, how are you doing with you know, the folks that have this? And um, they went ahead and decided to bring a device into the household. They're doing significantly better. And my partner Vaughn wasn't feeling well, so we started using it as well. And what was surprising to me was not only how quickly, um, how quickly Vaughn started to feel better, but having it in the house, and I started using it, I don't think I realized that I really wasn't thriving. And I wasn't feeling as well. I'd had a bout of pneumonia, and then I would get better, but I wouldn't get 100% well. And then I had another upper respiratory, second bout of pneumonia. And when I started to use this, suddenly my, you know, I felt my energy coming back. And there was a significant improvement in my health. And this got my interest. And I said, okay, you know, exactly what's going on here and what percentage of the people that are using it are experiencing the same kind of benefit from it. And um, so we found a way to start to look at that and see what, what this thing is doing. So Aaron um, introduced me to Arthur and started to come in and help with the work that the foundation was doing. They already had a fabulous program in place, which is the Lyme to Wellness program. So Arthur, I'll let you say a little bit about awesome. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that, Jackie. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been a huge light bulb moment for you when you're like, I didn't even know there's anything wrong with me. Yeah. Right? And then you start feeling better. And it raises started... the it raises the new sort of baseline, right? The new baseline, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Incredibly. Okay, so how uh how then did this this foundation, this dream that you had at fourteen start to come to fruition and when you met Aaron, give us a little bit of how the foundation actually is operating now. Sure. Uh when when Aaron came uh, together, we came together, uh, the idea of being able to truly find a technology that could be actually um, of value to helping a lot of people. This has been my search actually for uh, almost two decades. Like what can really help people's um, life force increase? Because I, I know when a, one has a strong life force, they have a tendency to overcome their challenges with a cold or, or anything like that. They seem to have a stronger immune system. So the people that were compromised could really see them suffer. And so that's really where it came in is out of compassion. Like I have such great health and I see so many people, even in my own family that were challenged. And that allowed uh, me to just start searching uh, about foundations and about nonprofits. And I really started digging and I found an incredible woman that literally took 
me under her wing and said, let me teach you about the differences of these organizations and how you can set up multiple programs in a foundation versus a nonprofit. So our foundation has a nonprofit status, but we're able to do multiple programs in the foundations. Oh, interesting. I didn't even know there was a distinction mm -hmm. there either. Oh, mm -hmm. go figure. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So that really helped me to start getting excited. And when I shared it with Aaron, he's like, you got to do this. This is, this is your calling. I said, I know it's my calling. And so he was very supportive. He says, well, maybe what we can do is, is, um, let's, let's look at how we can take a little bit of money from each device that's being sold and let's donate that to the foundation. And that started giving us a little bit of traction so I could pay a couple of people part time to come in and start helping build the programs. And, uh, that's how, that's literally how it got birthed. And in terms of the, um, the program now, I don't know that much about it. Um, other than qualifications for it being that a, uh, a family has got to have three diagnosed Lyme uh, victims, I guess you call them, or patients. <laughs> or <laughs> What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> you need three or more people in the household who have been diagnosed with <laughs> Lyme been disease. Okay, but thank you. Yes. I yeah. get the terminology right there. Yeah. At which point the foundation lends them a device which run anywhere between eight and $10,000 if you wanted to go buy one of these. Uh, and then they get it for four months, is that? Right, we place a device with a family who qualifies mm -hmm. and we have significantly more applicants for this program than we do devices. So we're looking at the state that the family's in. Um, uh, okay. What we're finding with a lot of the applicants, and again, it's surprisingly um, consistent and heartbreaking, is that you've got parents who've lost jobs, they've lost homes, the kids are not able to go to school. Um, it's astonishing to me. I, I certainly didn't realize before I came in and started having this conversation how much people were struggling with this. So what we do is we try and place the devices with families where we're going to get, um, be able to help the greatest number of people, and also for the foundation to collect as much data as they can. So what we do is in exchange, we'll place a device for four months, and in exchange we're collecting data back from those families. Oh, nice. So weekly what they're doing is they're telling us where they are with their symptoms, if they're doing anything else. So we've been collecting that data and looking at what happens to this this group in this household and this group in this household and then putting it together over the four months of use when the four months is up we bring the device back we test it to make sure it's functioning properly and immediately place it with the next family so every device allows us to serve you know a minimum of three families a year three or more in the household so we're serving 12 to 15 people on average per year with one device and the results have been astounding. And the other thing that's been amazing is that many of these families that were, you know, there was no way they could access or be able to afford to purchase a device, we find that parents are able to go back to work, kids start to go back to school, significant reduction in symptoms, and that most of these families choose to find a way to obtain a device because they're feeling better they see a significant change. Often they've tried everything you can imagine yeah. to get to this point and they don't want to be without it. I so, bet. I yeah. bet you start getting <laughs> symptom relief. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm not sending that thing back. Sell the car, honey. Yeah, guess exactly. Yeah. Cancel if, cable. Uh, let me see. Stop. Get get rid of the lawn. Put in some cacti. Yeah. Uh, wow, that's, that's fascinating. So I guess one of the cool things from the foundation point of view then is – you can request that data and make that sort of a stipulation of the loan. Whereas if I go buy a device for eight, mm -hmm. $10,000, I'm like, peace, I'm moving to Brazil with this thing. You're never going to hear from me again. I'm going to yeah. go get well. I have no incentive whatsoever exactly. to report back the results to said company that sold me the thing. Absolutely. So that's interesting. And then do you have in terms of the, you know, all of these things with this type of technology is you have to dance around so much with terminology and, and the legality of medical devices versus non-medical devices and the amp coil being a non-medical device that helps the body to restore its sense of balance and relieve symptoms from different things and all of those things because you, you have to phrase things in a way that maintains integrity and legality. As, and I'm sure that has to do also with the studies and being able to collect data as well. You can't make claims if you don't have a medical device. So 
you guys being the foundation that <clears throat> is not a part of Amp Coil, but rather that Amp Coil helps the foundation by lending these devices. Do you guys have any more power or leeway in terms of like being able not only to collect the data, but to be able to give empirical e evidence out as to here's what it does? We do. And actually, um, Amp Coil doesn't lend devices. We raise money uh, and we purchase devices. Okay. And we need to be completely objective in the data that we're collecting I so see. that we can, you know, we're looking to see, does it work? Um, exactly how does it work? What does it do? And what is it that people are experiencing? And there's no... Um, incentive for the families that are in the Lyme to Wellness program to provide any data other than what they're actually experiencing. It's not like they get to keep it better if they say that it's helping them. <laughs> right, you know, right. They're going to have their period of use. So one of the things that I look at, and we can talk about the data that's come back, and it's a relatively small sample size, but it's significant. Um, one of the things that I look at is if these families choose to find a way to obtain a device that indicates that they believe after four months of use that it's significantly oh, yeah. helping them or that they wouldn't bother yeah. to do that. Do you know that. what percentage of families uh, It's It's over 90%. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That are, so these are people that obviously didn't have the money to buy it because they're out of work, because they yeah. are debilitated. They get back to work. They start paying off their debt, getting back caught up with finances to the point where then they can now purchase... Device. Yeah. Wow. And if we're talking about reduction in debt, so the lowest percentage of all of the data we've collected, the lowest statistic is that 36% report a reduction in debt. But that includes everybody in the sample, including the children who weren't working to begin with. Oh, right. right. Okay. So we're wow. looking at a pretty significant number here that, that show a reduction in debt. And when we look at the data that's come back, 93% um, of the respondents report a reduction in pain. 89% increased mental clarity, 88% increased performance stamina, 87% improved relationships. And, and this information is available on our website. There's a lot more than these few numbers. But if you think about something like a reduction in pain, if you're chronically ill, what does that mean? Right, so okay, my, my pain level, maybe it dropped from an, a 9 or a 10 down to a 5 or a 6, and that's important. But what does it mean to the experience of the human being? What happens when you wake up in the morning and you're not in screaming pain and you can look at your husband or your wife and actually have a conversation with them? You can get out of bed and you can make breakfast for your kids or be there to help them with their homework when they come home from school. So you know, the, the stories that we're getting back are so deeply moving and so profound because for each one of these, you know, kind of, very objective pieces of information, what it speaks to is an incredible shift in the human experience. The reduction in symptoms allow human beings to come back to experiencing interaction with oh, those that so, they love. That's so true. I yeah. mean, just <laughs> as I said, I'm a relatively healthy guy. I'm not as much as our man Arthur here. <laughs> but if I just sleep poorly one night, yeah. I'm a freaking jerk compared yeah. to my normal... Yeah. Pretty compassionate, kind, friendly self. Mm -hmm. You know, if I don't feel well, it's very difficult because it all comes down to energy. If you don't have, if you don't have mitochondrial energy, it's very difficult to have healthy relationships, healthy communication, to be patient, <laughs> you know, to be loving, to really access your true, higher self. Because the physical meat suit that we're all gifted with slash stuck in tortures you and then your yeah. higher self is like sorry i can't get in there because the body's in survival mode it's like it's a horrible feedback loop it's a horrible feedback loop and one of the things that the parents report often in in conversation and they'll send in you know an experience they'll want to share what their experience is and they talk about seeing a reduction in rage they hear their children laughing for the first time they hear the children being kind to each other again. And, you know, these are things that we take for granted, that children should be able to get up and go out and play and be in joy and be engaging with each other and interacting with each other. And often what we hear is we haven't heard the laughter 
or the lack of rage in years in our household. And we're so grateful. We're so grateful for the space where we're seeing our children again and being able to, to be in communication and just in relationship with them in a normal way. When it comes to the data, you guys, <clears throat> in addition to anecdotal data from users, do you foresee, given, you know, I know research is obviously mm -hmm. really expensive, more expensive than buying devices and lending them to people, but do you see a point coming uh, anytime soon where you can do more, even lightweight empirical Objective, studies, absolutely. where you're doing live blood cell analysis, you know, having someone's blood blood work done before and after mm -hmm. a session, uh, gut biome testing, things like that. Well, even that, things or? as simple as a range of motion. And oh. yeah, I'm um, just being able to test oxygenation of the blood. I mean, there are very simple things that we can do. And we are in the process of working with a team of uh, medical doctors and naturopathic MDs to um, move into more clinical studies. So awesome. we are about 90% through the first proposal that we will submit for an IRB overseen oh, clinical wow. trial. Damn, yeah, like so the real deal. The real deal. That's yeah. amazing. Yes. Because I know, you know, for myself, I'm just an inherent seeker. I just, I just, I'll try any meditation. I'll try any yoga. I'll try any <laughs> vitamin, any device, any supplement. If I have an intuitive feeling that it'll work, you know, yeah. but it's much more meaningful to me. If I could just see a couple studies, a couple photos, a couple testimonials, it just gives me that much more uh, umph, you know, mm -hmm. and enthusiasm about said protocol, whatever it might be. I mean, even just today, I was looking at uh, someone's website. Um, I believe her name was Lori. She wrote a book about Lyme. She was there at the conference. And she said, oh, you got, I'm going to send you an email. Go to my homepage. Look at my son's live blood cell analysis. And you see before amp coil and after and the before. I talked about this, forgive me, audience in the last interview that I just did prior to this. But his before blood, it didn't look like blood. Mm -hmm. It looked like a freaking alien invasion. It was like mutant blood, zombie blood. It was just horrific. And then these, the after photos, just these beautiful red blood cells just bouncing around all around, getting along great. No interference, no funky stuff in there. And uh, when I see things like that, that makes me want to buy something, you know, which so I'm like, I want blood that looks that right. pretty. And, and these things are really helpful. And then when we look at doing a more traditional um, clinical trial, we're looking at stepping back and only using data collection that is very um, conservative and tried and true. And something that's been, so it, it's a combination of objective data collection. So we're looking physiologically, what is it that the body's doing? And then we're also looking for the subjective markers. So we're looking at using surveys that are widely used, widely published, oh, and cool. have a lot cool. of experience that, that speak to pain and anxiety and, right. you know, quality of life. Right. Yeah. Right, because the more uh, the more nuanced a survey is, mm -hmm. the more skewed the results could be. Right. Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Do you have anything to add to that? It it allows uh, more, I would say, authentic results where people can actually trust the the procedural way that that the study was done, and because those are tried and true, you know, specific. Um, benchmarks then when the results are there it's indisputable mm -hmm. and so that for us is an important aspect for, for us to be able to produce uh, and do the study so that it takes it to the next level and people can feel um, even a more driven to possibly support what these studies are actually showing which has been our goal all along Right. So right now with, with the foundation, it goes without saying that there's more sick families out there that are on a waiting list. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like you have to prove to people, hey, this thing works and it's going to help you with the symptoms of Lyme or other autoimmune issues. There's plenty of people there already that are like, hey, I'm convinced enough to try it and I don't have the money to buy it. Yeah. But you could use this data and this evidence, that, the studies that you're going to be working on to say, hey, people with money that want to put your money behind a charity that's legit that is really helping people that isn't uh you know snake oil Here's and the is data identif we've got. And, and identifying so we have this initial set of data that shows really surprising and promising 
results, uh, much higher response rates than we expected, from much the higher benefit mm-hmm. from the surveys yeah. that we've done. How, and, and how many people are those what that numbers does, based on with that sample uh, group? That sample group was 91 people. Yeah. Wow. So what we're what this does is it says this is evidence that it's time to look further. And if I'm looking at it from a very objective standpoint, what I want to know is, is this true? Does this work? Um, is this repeatable? Certainly with the experience that we're having, and, and, you know, Arthur and I are in touch with the families, and we have so many families that are waiting, the experience is certainly that, um, that it is working, that people are feeling better. And from an objective place, we want to come in and look at a larger group, and we want to look at... Um, using practitioners that are are applying the same protocols across the board to everybody who's in the study and standardizing it. Oh, okay. right. Because with this particular device, I mean, it's really a user generated they're and, using and it ex- in the home yeah i mean like and they tell us what they're doing okay and they may use it one person may use it twice a week somebody else may use it twice a day right yeah and there's you know hundreds if not thousands of different combinations of frequencies that you can sort of you know customize as a user to exactly That's the thing. exactly and then right. and, and mm, so this will be very standardized right and as we go in and we're talking to the doctors and the researchers and and working with them to create it you know their first um, question is does this or does this not alleviate human suffering and in what what way does it do that and i love coming in from this very objective place um, especially given the um, excitement that that we have from what's already come back and what the experience has been. And as you were asking, we have uh, so many more people waiting for devices than we have. So right now... We have 90 families that are waiting. And I sense that once those 90 families have the ability to be able to do the system trackers and then to start this IRB that we will literally, it'll go from 90 to 900 to 9,000. Yeah, it will just grow as you, I, I don't know if the listeners know this statistic, but there is 300,000 people a year diagnosed with Lyme's disease. Wow. In the United States. And that's 300,000 new, new cases yes. of Lyme yes. disease oh every God. year in the United that's States. That's six football fields. Yeah. I mean, f- football stadiums of people. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's insane. It's insane. And you, know, when, it's, you know, it's strange about that because obviously I'm in, I'm in the field and I kind of have my finger on the pulse of what's what. And when my mom first got Lyme, it was misdiagnosed for years as chronic fatigue and all this kind of stuff. I mean, who knows what the stuff even is at the end of the day, especially after my conversation with Dr. <laughs> Dr. Drake, because everything <laughs> morphs into other things and Worms. it just gets chaotic. But anyway, let's just call it Lyme. And when I told people and my mom had Lyme, no one even knew what I was talking about, mm-hmm. let alone her. I mean, I feel so bad. She would try to explain to doctors and they'd tell her it's all in her head. Mm-hmm. And She'd tell family and, you, I mean, internet was kind of, this is, you know, going back 20 years, internet was not what it is now. You couldn't find the data on things that you want to look for. And, and uh, over the years, I have noticed, especially being in this industry more now, uh, health and wellness and stuff with the podcast, I'm like, I meet someone every freaking day that has mm-hmm. Lyme. I'm like, what? And where is it's this just, coming from? It, dude, it's, it's crazy. everywhere. <laughs> it's crazy. everywhere. Yeah. It was, yeah. Didn't Aaron at one point say, you know, that he asked a hundred people if they knew mm-hmm. one person that had Lyme. Do you, you remember the stat with that? I don't remember the number, but it was astonishingly yeah, high. It was, like, it was he, like almost all of them. Yeah, almost yeah. all hundred people knew someone. Knew, you know, knew someone who had Lyme. Where, however remote in their in their sphere of uh, influence that had Lyme. I'm just like, that is so weird. It's back yeah. when I first heard about it. Was like, My mom was the only one. <laughs> yeah, you know? but not at all. And, and I mean, that's what's been so astonishing to both of us. I mean, we knew it was out there, um, but... I had no idea that it was affecting this many people and that it was so devastating. You know, friends, family, and uh, extended family. And at this point, we've got 90 applicants. And what I would say is that we have chosen not to spread the word significantly at this point about this program. It's called the the Wellness for Humanity Lyme to Wellness Program. It's on our website. You can certainly go and apply on the website. But we have 
so many more people waiting than we have devices. Yeah. And, you know, if we were to announce tomorrow that we had this beautiful influx of devices and we could get them out to people and we let people know that we'd have hundreds and thousands of applicants. There's just so many people who need the help. So people that are hearing this now, I mean, obviously there's going to be a portion of people that are like, oh, I have Lyme or someone in my family or a friend. Wow, I want to apply. What's the URL? I'm going to go to the show notes, which by the way, of course, you can get at lukestory.com forward slash newsletter. That's lukestory.com forward slash newsletter. I'll send you the show notes from this and every episode. When they do that and they get these show notes, they're going to apply and be on a waiting list forever. So I'd really like to speak to people that hear this. Mm -hmm. that whether they know someone so afflicted or not and are like, wow, I really want to get behind a charitable organization. I mean, whether they, it helps them with taxes or for whatever freaking reason, um, what kind of goals do you guys have and what kind of support do you need if somebody could forward this to someone who's a philanthropist or someone that's got deep mm -hmm. pockets that's like looking for something meaningful and valid to support? Well, uh, it's a great question. Uh, we have set this infrastructure up with the foundation so that after the third year we're sustain we're self-sustaining so our whole drive behind it is to uh, launch our first our first full year which would uh, be a just under 1.5 million five million that would uh, incredibly purchase 150 amp coal units a staff to be able to handle the stats and the information as well as supporting those Lyme to wellness families. Cause in the beginning there's a little bit of support and hand holding hand holdings to make sure that they really understand how to use the equipment properly. And then th that would go in four months would go to another family. So now we're looking at literally 450 families, roughly between 1200 and 1500 people in beings. one year. And so that's exciting. And uh, and then what about the, uh, I think you guys were mentioning something about a crowdfunding goal. Like your, did mm -hmm. you have an initial goal that was substantially less than one, almost 1 1.5 million? Absolutely. 35,000 would help us uh, put our crowdfunding program together. And that would allow us then to gain some traction and let more people know because we'd be able to get that out there and letting people know right. about right and that right. would help you get to the one point almost 1.5 absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> right, right, right. and the other things that individuals can do if you are listening and you have a friend or a loved one or a family member who could use help getting back to a place where they're experiencing a reduction of symptoms you can come to the foundation website you can choose to donate a device to someone in need so uh, today um, you can purchase an AMP coil for just under $8,000, the 2.0, and you would make a donation on the foundation site. You would designate who the recipient is, and you'd receive a full um, a tax deductible receipt for that donation to the foundation, and we would provide the AMP coil to the recipient that you designate. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Now, you can't buy it for yourself, right. but you can give it to someone else. That's cool. You can also come on and donate that same device and tell us, you know what, don't send it to somebody I know, but please take it and put it into the Lyme to Wellness program and start helping all of these people who need help. Right. So, so that, somebody, that's a much lower level to get involved and right. they provide significant assistance. So somebody could really essentially foster a device Absolutely. and then that device is going to serve X amount of people, families of three per year. Yes. We're doing maybe four cycles in the course of a year for three people, three children. So they could have effectively help 12 people to heal. A minimum of 12 a people. A minimum of 12 yes. within the first year. Yeah. Exactly. Mm, that's cool. Yeah. Wow, this is exciting. I don't know anything about <laughs> foundations and nonprofits and charitable stuff, as I said earlier. Yeah. So I'm like, well, this is so interesting how this works. I just have never sat down and talked to anyone about it. Um, and this one's close to my heart because I believe in the technology that you guys are you know, using as a vehicle with the foundation. And also, as these numbers grow and I meet more and more people that are suffering like my mom and my immediate family, it's like, God, this is the one thing that really, really needs attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's next level. And I meet so many young people now too. That's what's nuts. Really surprising. Yeah. And so many people, I mean, a lot of people that listen to my podcast and are in my Facebook group have Lyme, you know, and they, cause a lot of them have listened to the episode I did last year. Mm -hmm. 
and they uh, many of them were at the <laughs> at the summit actually you know a lot of people came up oh i found out about amp quilt because of your show and i'm like yes that's why i do the stuff that i do i'm so passionate about it yeah. and um you know just to get people to know about the foundation and have them you know i'm seeing i get this vision of you know it's not just individuals but what about all the functional medicine doctors and all the naturopaths out there that are beating their freaking heads against the wall mm -hmm. trying to treat people for lyme probably you know increasingly having, starting to come in and use this technology right the i mean they're having, i'm out. sure you know some degree yeah. of success here or there but i mean this is like this success is like nothing i've seen in this with this particular um illness so imagine if mm -hmm. we get some of those those doctors involved with the foundation and people that are actually you know have well, money be behind wonder it. that would be wonderful and it would be wonderful if we had some of those doctors that would have several devices and they could become um, participants in the study right. so we have folks that are registering to be in the study they're choosing to engage and they're going to that doctor's office and having two or three sessions a week and doing that for the 12 to 16 weeks of the study. And right. we know that it's being handled properly. That would be fabulous. So someone could f essentially, let's say like there's a functional medicine clinic or a naturopath clinic where one or more natural doctors are working. One could uh, foster a device, pay for a device, uh, indicate that they want it there where yeah, it's going to have the absolutely. most impact in terms of the data that you're able to extract because that's not just one family. That's one practitioner that's running, you know, what, eight patients per day through that yeah. one device or, or more, more people, if there's more devices, obviously, because the treatment be times are short. I mean, that's the thing. You're not, you're doing what 30 to 60 minutes per day max if 70, you're a user, yeah. right? Yeah. 30 to 70. Mm -hmm. So one device in a practitioner's office can treat multiple people in one day. That's a lot of freaking data yeah. in a short period of time. Yeah. That's fabulous. And if you multiply devices at that practitioner's office, like yeah. It's crazy. And for your listeners, I mean, that's a great idea. If you want to come in and donate a device to a Lyme literate doctor or to a functional medicine doctor who's been helpful and helped you to feel better, what a fabulous thing to do because it opens the door for so many more. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. keep that in mind myself because I do get approached uh, periodically by doctors who specialize in Lyme. Mm -hmm. Uh, or they're just recommended to me, Dr. Klinghart, different people. I mean, sure. some of the big dogs. And I'm like, God, they need to know about this. <laughs> you know, if you have some of those needle moving names that have a wide sphere of influence within that and that are highly revered for their success rate with autoimmune and things like Lyme, you need a few of those to latch on to this and go, oh, let's just kind of put to the side all of, oh, try these herbs. Oops, that didn't work. Try the ozone. Oops, try the rife. Try the this. And it's just like one, two punch. Yeah, I'm getting excited for you guys. <laughs> I don't even know where. This is an interview anymore? I don't know. We're just shooting the shit now. Well, but, uh, you know, one thing that was interesting, we had uh, a pa two pastures uh, purchase mm -hmm. a device and purchase it to donate it to their congregation. And now there's 20 people that are using that device. Yeah. It's in oh, the Washington, cool. D.C. area. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And across the board, the folks that are using it are sending back these stories with these beautiful shifts in their experience where they're feeling better and they're experiencing significant benefit. So, you know, this is another model that we're looking to start to support, which is the community wellness program. So you have a community, it could be a, a faith-based or any kind of a community group, a veterans group that wants to put a device, a single device in and have it available. You need one person who knows how to operate it. They could help people with it. But how beautiful if that technology is in use eight or 10 hours a day, every yeah. day rather than, yeah. Yeah, that's you kind of just described my living room. <laughs> 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 All my my friends in recovery and stuff come over a lot and use it, you know. But we don't. I, now that I've been up here and I'm really I'm learning a lot more about the technology. I feel like I've sort of had a Ferrari in my garage and I'm still riding a bicycle around. You know, I have the yeah. amp quill there and I use it, but I know I'm not using it to its fullest potential. And when I have you know, close friends and family come over and use it. We don't really do extended protocol. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I just, I get them kind of band-aided up and feeling good. And it feels nice to be able to help people like that. But I mean, I can think of, I think of one acquaintance right now that I have that's in my industry that has Lyme. I'm like, I just need to call her and just give her a key to my apartment. It's like, yeah. she'd come over there every day for an hour. It's, I'm not even going to notice she's there, you know? And, and then a couple you. other friends that have some fairly serious issues that, I think could be helped just even outside of Lyme, you know? It would be wonderful for you to start to understand how to inform them what to do with it. 
So with the Lyme to Wellness families, what we find is that, you know, initially when they're kind of just doing that, that those beginning steps, there's not nearly as much reduction of symptoms. But as they actually work through the suggested use and they start that consistency of entrainment and really getting into um, the protocols where they're completing a, you know, six time journey or a 10 time journey that that's where we're really starting to see the reduction in symptoms and the changes in quality of life. So if you've got friends who can use it, it'd be wonderful to provide that information so that they could have that benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think my, my bonehead friends just want to play with the voice analysis <laughs> and like change it every time. I'm like, no, you're supposed to do an analysis, then run a protocol, <laughs> then way later on do another analysis, you know, it's giving a bunch of grown uh, man boys a, 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 a tool like this it can be often used as a toy you know we use it to meditate and just feel really good but i'm i'm realizing now there's so much more potential i actually i can't wait to get going on my on my uh bugs you know i've got some parasites and things like that i can't wait to like actually follow a specific protocol and knock them out you know one thing i'd like to share with you luke is that we could send you the system tracker so once a week, you're filling out the system tracker. What we find out uh, and what we have found out with the Lyme to Wellness uh, participants is that once they start to pay attention and fill that, that record out of those 10 questions, after like a month, they're like, they see that they are starting to see some changes. Oh, right. And it does something to them to become more motivated and more aware of like, oh, I am getting better. Just uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's a, that's a good point. I've noticed that when I quantify some of my behaviors or, or habits, such as sleep, you know, I have this ring here that everyone says, "Oh, it's a cool ring." I go, "No, this is a really sophisticated uh, tracking ring that tracks your sleep and a number of other mm -hmm. biomarkers. It's called an aura ring." And uh, every day I get up and I check my sleep score, and it helps me to improve my sleep yeah. habits because I see results. So exactly what you're saying mm -hmm. is true. Whereas if you're using something and you're not tracking or there's not a way to track it, it's like, I don't know, does it do anything? Eh, should I do it today? Eh, <laughs> right? Sure. That's how, that's how most supplements are, mm -hmm. to be honest. You know, I'll read a supplement's website. I go, oh, wow, impressive studies. Wow, this you sounds great. This. I have to have this. And I take it and my friends go, is, is it legit? I go, I don't know. No idea. Yeah, I don't <laughs> no know. Idea. It was 70 bucks. I hope so, you know. <laughs> there are a few supplements I use now that are quantifiable and I go oh yeah definitely I miss it when I don't have it but you know a lot of this stuff is just like fluff you know until you start to track it and quantify and then you know oh yeah there has been a marked improvement yeah. and the other thing that we hear from people like kind of in the same way is that frequently the feedback is that the users are able to significantly reduce or stop taking many of the supplements um, and we had one woman there today who had, you know, reduced her prescription medication, you know, significantly. Oh, I think, didn't she say she was on 90? Uh, I think the, I think the number That's, was 90 medications and supplements. I don't know the ratio. I don't of know those. the ratio either, but yeah. And, and you know, this is not a one up. We hear this across the board. You wow. know, we've got um, lots of testimonials of people talking about when you look at debt reduction, clearly the ability to be functional, to go back to work is very beneficial. But the other piece is that people are finding that they're spending a lot less money on the supplements and the alternative pieces that right. can be astoundingly expensive yeah. for people who are chronic. That's what Ill. I try to explain to people when they uh, inquire to me about the amp coil and it's 8,500 or whatever it is. Uh, oh my God, there's so much money. And I'm always like, I think, yeah, it is. But I think about for myself, how much money I spend on practitioners, mm -hmm. acupuncture, 150 bucks, go get a massage, 80 bucks, go see some, you know, do blood ozone, 500 bucks yep. per session on, you know, on and on and on. I mean, I could, if you don't want to see my, uh, my P and L of the spending <laughs> on my health and, and wellness. And there are people who show that sometimes yeah. and it's incredible. But I mean, if, it, listen, if I stop doing everything I do right now, and just saved up for an amp coil, I could have one in, I would say, four months. Yeah. But just as a, as a rough guess, if I yeah. just stop all my shenanigans and stop spending mm -hmm. money with all my biohacking and stuff like that. And what That's we're what I try seeing to explain is people. the reverse. What we're seeing is people that are spending $2,000, $3,000 a month because they're finding that that's what they need to survive. And as they start to use this technology over the course of several months, 
six months, eight months, they're finding that that starts to diminish and they're starting to be able to save money again. Right. Yeah. Which right. is, which is an extraordinary experience. That's cool. Yeah. Especially a beneficiary of the program that you guys have too, because they didn't spend any money to begin with. Yeah. They're just like, cool, I'm well, I'm better in four months. Now I'm going to take that money that I have. And in most cases, as mm -hmm. you said, just go ahead and buy it. They find device. a way to do that. Yeah. That's cool. Well, awesome, man. Anything else uh, we can add? You know, what, what, other than the goals that you've mentioned, is there anything else people can do to help or support? Uh, you know, where do you want them to go in terms of the website? What would be a first step if somebody wanted to check you guys out? You want to start just at the Wellness for Humanity site, which is um, W F H F. <laughs> it's W F H Foundation dot org. Yeah, W F H Foundation dot okay. and we'll put it in the show dot org. notes too. Yeah. Um, so you want to start there, and when you get to our homepage, you will see it. it at least today, um, a more complete representation of the data collection that we've done and what those results were. You can look at all of our programs. There's a place where, you know, you can make a donation and support the work that we're doing. So there people are can places donate right on the site. Check out, put it in a cart, yep. ding, donate. You can so. also um, apply for our programs. Um, we do have a new... And, and there'll be a series of, of um, support tools that we provide on the site. So we have a product that helps with remineralization. Um, interesting conversation that many of the minerals that used to be in our food supply are now significantly depleted, and the body does need those minerals in order to be in a healthy state. So our soil is made out of dust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and chemicals. Yeah. Um, so, you know, starting just this month we've introduced that and cool so that's something that you can go that's a wonderful way to support the foundation any tool that we make available um through the foundation some portion of that will go to benefit the foundation's oh, that's smart. programs that's awesome oh yeah and that reminds me i'm, I'm hoping that you weren't going to forget but tell me about this uh space blanket arthur yeah. no i always i was you guys i i might have mentioned on the show i have something called a solaris health blanket it's from the russian space program and I call it my space blanket, and I use it for flying and stuff. And then lo and behold, Ar I said, Arthur, what else are you working on? And he <laughs> says, well, I'm working on this jet lag blanket or something. So what's up exactly. with that? Exactly. Uh, so it's uh, 88 pulverized crystals. It's a formula I worked on for three years. I've been working on this actually for 15 years. The last 10 years I've been producing a fleece blanket that you can sleep with uh, that increases circulation, depth of sleep, a recovery from exhaustion and there's studies done on that and now we've made it into a very thin blanket that's coming out in December and that has uh, it's 50% uh, of the uh, what we call phi fiber which is a crystal fiber and which is a uh, rayon crystallized fiber and then 30% uh, a thermal regulating fiber which helps to regulate so if you're warm it kind of cools down if you're cool it kind of warms up and then tw uh, 20 percent linen so that's coming out and that can be used you know at your home on the couch or or you know when you're traveling we've we've placed some of these on um, people's seats and they have a six hour drive to make and they get out of the car and they're like Oh my gosh, there's oh, I'm like, I'm not exhausted I'm use it in my car. Yeah. <laughs> Driving up here to Tahoe. I, <laughs> you guys got, I mean, I just got to show the inside of my car that the gadgets I have in there. I have a molecular hydrogen <laughs> machine. It's $7,000 in my back seat. I got a, a, a nano V. I'm not trying to brag about the prices. I'm just telling you like, how serious I am about how driving F's me up. And I have this thing called the nano V. It makes exclusion zone water mist that you mm, inhale. Nice. Freaking things, $12,000 huge bag of supplements i have a um uh i have a geopathic stress blocker in my back seat because you're crossing over all these ley lines yeah. as you drive yeah. da, 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 da. Yeah. i have one of those that harmonizes the inside of the car i have my blue shield um i always have one in my pocket a blue shield um scalar wave generator mm -hmm. in the car one in my pocket and still, I drove up here from L.A. and was smoked the day afterward with all that. And same with flying. I mean, all the stuff I do, I can only imagine what it would be like if I just was a normal person that gets in my little EMF bomb of a car and drives, you know, 10 hours to Lake Tahoe. So, 
You brought up a really great Anything po- you got for travel, sure. I'm going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you re- brought up a great point. Uh, there's a woman that did, that worked for Bob Marshall. She actually. Oh, uh, I, I loved Bob Marshall. Yeah. Was so she passed. was the uh, assistant. I've got, I've got his freaking uh, copper pyramid in my car too. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she had, did a lot of the testing with him. Um, and she tested the blanket that we had yesterday. And she said, oh my gosh, this is not affected by the uh, stress, the geopathic stress lines. Oh, she says really? It, it's not affected. Interesting. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I recently did an episode about EMFs and the geopathic stress. I was not even aware of that part. I knew about mm-hmm. the magnetic. I knew about the electric. I knew about the radio waves. But the guy I did it with, he does. Um, he's a, um, a building biologist. And so he comes in and has like, ten thousand dollars worth of equipment and test everything and he has his little um dousing those dousing mm-hmm. rods and he's we were at this conference at paleo fx in austin he goes watch this and he walks across the floor and the dousing rods are together and then all of a sudden they go boing and they bounce together and we look down and there's a crack in the concrete and you could walk around the whole building with those yeah. dousing rods and every time you hit a crack boing they snap together even if you're looking up i mean it's not a you know it's not a placebo yeah. psychosomatic thing and yeah. he said yeah those are those are ley lines and when you walk across that there's an interruption in your bioenergetic field and he said that's why cuz i'm always trying to cure the driving and the air travel so that's one of the reasons you get so screwed up when you drive some people that are sensitive is cuz you're crossing over thousands of those per minute or whatever you know <laughs> And so, it's yeah. in, and it's impacting you, right? Yes. Right, yeah. And so with Bob Marshall, who you're referring to, he was big in kinesiology and he tested all supplements and pyramids and energetics and stuff. So that's cool. If your blanket passed his right hand girl's kinesiologic yep. muscle testing, then that must be good. So when the blanket comes out in December, which would probably be around when this episode comes out, I think I'm usually about two months ahead. Will that be available on the website, the foundation site too? It, it will be. And it'll be yeah. another one of those products you're going to lay out that help support the foundation. Absolutely. Cool. That's a good idea. I think that's a good way to do it. Yeah. And you got your minerals and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then just donations. All right. Anything else we need to know before we check out? We're starting a, a veterans program in January. We still don't have that particular program completely laid out yet. We're still in a process and talking to some other vets. If it might be a PTSD type of study. So we're still in the process Using of that. Using the amp coil? Using, well? the, using the amp coil and possibly the blanket and oh, the minerals nice. and combining it and then having that Sweet. study done. Yeah. So you take the minerals, wrap yourself in the blanket, then do a coiling <laughs> session. That's <laughs> awesome, really man. Good. Thank you. you Thank really you. Yeah, me. everyone... Everyone hates Donald Trump, you know, and, you know, everyone has their issues politically. I don't talk about politics on the show, but one thing that I do like about him is he seems to care about the veterans. And I never hear anyone in politics really talking about the veterans. You know, it's mm-hmm. like I come from the sort of punk rock generation where you're like, screw war, screw soldiers. And as I've gotten older, I realized like, wow, no, yeah. if anyone should be taken care of, it's our freaking vets, dude. Yeah. I mean, seriously. I can't Absolutely. imagine the sacrifice that these men yeah. and women make, you know, and even law enforcement, same thing when I was a kid, F the cops, you know, <laughs> you get, get a little older, which took me maybe till I was 40. And I was like, actually, I really respect police, yeah. you know, what they're doing. I'm, of course there are corrupt ones and all that. And, you know, I don't like war obviously, but, uh, you know, humans are at war. It's what we do. It's duality. And so I love the idea of helping veterans. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And actually, uh, I, um, uh, have gotten feedback from a number of veterans that listen to this podcast and it's benefited them. Oh, that's Different wonderful. things oh, that's we talk cool. about. Yeah. And those that's are some wonderful. of the most meaningful yeah. uh, emails that I get guys with PTSD and trauma and addiction issues and all this kind of stuff. Huge. So that's awesome. Well, Thank you. Yeah. For so that. check back in and, um, and let me, I can't believe I just mentioned Donald Trump. Everyone's going to delete my app or my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always find the good in everything though. It's part of my personality. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's it, you guys. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Thanks so thank much you. for, for what you're doing and for coming on the podcast. I'm really, I feel like I got a lot accomplished today with these two interviews and they, they dovetail nicely and it's going to really help a lot of people. And that's my mission. Wonderful. Uh, one thing I forgot in the last interview and this is the first time in, I must have recorded 180 of them by now or something, is I always ask the same question. Uh, I say, You've, you both have taught me a lot today. Who have been three teachers that um, you might recommend to us mm-hmm. that we go to? And I didn't ask my last two interviewees that question. It's the first one I've missed. So I'm not going to damn well miss it again. 
So who have been, you know, three mm. uh, teachers or teachings that have influenced your life or your work that we might be able to go uh, check out? Well, I, uh, I have a really, uh, I have a mentor for, thir uh, for 30 years. His name's Daisaku Ikeda. And uh, there's, this organization has thir 12 or 13 million people worldwide. And uh, I was raised in the youth with this uh, practice on uh, peace, culture, and education. And uh, the organization's called the SGI, means Soka Gakkai International, which is a, uh, a world peace organization that uh, stands for um, uh, uh, Soka Gakkai International, means uh, Value Creation Society. And it's really about uh, the happiness of ourselves and the happiness of others and how do we promote that and how do we invigorate others and how do we activate hope which is also part of our foundation is activating hope in people and i believe that that's what that organization does and i've learned so much i got the opportunity to be so involved with the organization when i was younger i got to be in the presence of my mentor uh being with rosa parks i was ha actually there on that day when he was there's actually Interesting enough, there is a mosaic at the UN building in San Francisco of my mentor in Rosa Parks shaking hands. Wow, crazy. Yeah. That's wild. So that's been a powerful influence, and the organization is incredible. It's all volunteer, and um, it's, it's really served my life in an incredible way. Wow, that's neat. Give me two more. <laughs> It could be a book or anything, too. Uh, well, I, I mentioned uh, the first man, Tom Wilhite, who started PSI, PSI, which is an organization um, kind of like the Forum or S or that type of... Se but the setting is more heart-based. It's more uh, gentle in its approaches. And uh, interesting enough, uh, Aaron at Ampcoil uh, also went through that entire program, too. Which really? We had found out that we had done it when we were younger. Oh, that's interesting. So that was cool. And then the third person that uh, I really enjoyed uh, was uh, a, a man that coaches me now, Jeff Patterson. Uh, and he's in Aspen and he coaches a lot of, well, um, people that are here to do their big thing and make big changes in the world, which is why I hired him as a coach. He's just been an incredible influence and more than anything is get to the core of wh who I am, what I believe, and then how I can help people and then to take that out into the world. So Awesome. Thanks, Arthur. My pleasure. Mm. Interesting question. Um, for me, I'd have to say that the first two people, the two people who have taught me the most have been my two children, um, my son and my daughter. They're both in their mid to late 20s. Um, to have had the um, incredible gift of living through deep trauma with two extraordinary human beings who were able to choose um, not to survive but to thrive and to find forgiveness and love and compassion and to step forward and be willing to open conversation um, with others who may not have yet found a way to speak or move through it um, has been very humbling and I'm deeply grateful uh, to have had the opportunity to experience that with them. And the other for me would be the Dalai Lama, who I had the opportunity to be in the presence of for um, a week. And the piece that came out of that for me, which was most profound, it sounds simple, but it is not, is that in the present moment, everything is perfect and that whatever it seems is happening unless we have the ability to fly around in 360 degrees and move forward and backward in time to understand how we got here and what will come from exactly what it is that's unfolding now we really have no idea what it is um, but to be able to move through the experience with an understanding that it is perfect and it is bringing us to where it is that we need to move next. So awesome. That's yeah. the lesson I'm reminding myself of every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> every day is full of things that the mind says, this shouldn't happen. That yeah. shouldn't happen. This shouldn't happen. That the shouldn't blame, happen. The guilt, That's the whole the, game. Yeah. That's the whole game. That's yeah. the whole game. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. It's been a lovely weekend, a lovely episode. And, uh, I look forward to 
supporting you guys. Stay in touch. Let me know what else we can do. And um, I have a feeling you're probably hearing from some of our listeners because it's a really inspiring thing that you're doing. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.